All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the City of Newcastle count, regular council meeting for Tuesday, May 17. We are halfway through May already. Um, will you please rise? And I'd like to call the meeting to order. Will you please rise and join me in the flag salute? And thank you for joining us on a lovely sunny evening and sorry we're indoors but maybe tomorrow night um, city clerk white can I get you to call the roll please deputy mayor Sherlock here councilmember Griffin here councilmember Villa senior here councilmember Lacocchio here uh, councilmember Charbonneau here. councilmember Clark here mayor Newing here all set all right, we have a quorum tonight. All seven folks are here for our meeting. Um, may I have, are there any objections to approval of the final agenda? Hearing none, agenda is approved. Moving on to public comment, item number four. Public comment will also include tonight the uh, any comments you wish to make on item number 11.5 which is the mobile food truck ordinance, or I'm sorry, mobile food vendors. And that is our ordinance we approved about a year ago. Um, that is up for review tonight. And audience uh, wishing to speak will have three minutes. We will have a countdown clock available for you. And please state your name and the residence in which you reside in. Uh, so Madam Mayor, no um, members of the public present have signed up to speak. Thank you. Any audience comment live? Just a couple people in the audience tonight. Again, this sunny evening, so glad everyone's enjoying that. Um, all right, we have a very special proclamation with us tonight, and our very own public works director, Director Jeff Bronze, is here with us. Welcome, Director Bronze. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Happy Council National Members. Public Works thank Week. And thank you and your team for all the hard work you do. Um, I, I just, I, I'd like to read this uh, proclamation. Whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities, emergency management, and services that are of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and the public health, high quality of life, and well being of the people of the city of Newcastle. And whereas these infrastructures, facilities, and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public works professionals who are federally mandated first responders and the engineers, managers, and employees at all levels of government and the private sector who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation, water supply, water treatment, and solid waste systems public buildings, and other structures and facilities essential for our citizens. And whereas it is in the public interest for the citizens, civic leaders, and children in the city of Newcastle to gain knowledge of and to maintain a progressive interest and understanding of the importance of public works and public works programs in their respective communities. And whereas the year 2022 marks the 62nd annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association. Now, therefore, I, Linda Newey, Mayor of the City of Newcastle, Washington, proclaim the week of May 15 through 21, 2022 as Public Works Week in the City of Newcastle. And I encourage all residents to recognize the contributions public works professionals make every day to protect our national health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. Congratulations. Thank you for all you do. I'll Thank tell you, you reading You're through welcome. that, I got tired just thinking of all you do. So <laughs> I was getting know. tired of listening. Now, now we need a little break here. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Moving on. Council comment. Council Member Clark, do you want to start us off tonight? Thank you, Mayor Newey. I feel silly that we have an empty audience. Last week we had a really good response. I felt like I was talking to somebody, but 
A um, few comments uh, between now and uh, our town hall, which is our next meeting, we'll have Memorial Day. I just wanted to say a few words about it. Um, of course, Memorial Day is a very special day in our country. It's a day to remember and honor all those who gave the sacrifice for our freedoms that we have today, men and women, hundreds of thousands over the course of our history. So please take a moment on that day to just say thank you. Um, you know, everybody celebrates differently. Um, <clears throat> so whatever works for you, it, it is an important day. A reminder to fly your flag at half mast if you have a flag. And most people will say, well, my flag's on the side of my house. What do I do? Well, you simply lower the flag perpendicular to the ground and that is acceptable. That's a half considered half mass. It's not required for homeowners or residents, but you're welcome to do that. It's encouraged. And of course, our city flag, I already talked to the director bronze, will be at half mast. The uh, requirement simply is that you lower the flag at sunrise and you raise it back at noon on that day. But typically what happens with government facilities is it goes all weekend, right? Because nobody's usually here on the holiday. Uh, there are some veteran services on the east side. Uh, you know, there's a lot of them all over. I encourage you to look. Uh, Preston, Fall City, Snoqualmie, North Bend, and Issaquah, where I will be all day. Um, there's a lot of ceremonies. Look that up if you want to go attend something. And I would encourage everybody to go at once time, at least one time in your life, to Tahoma National Cemetery on Memorial Day or Veterans Day. They decorate every grave with a flag. It's, it's spectacular. It's really impressive. So... <clears throat> Uh, moving on, I just wanted to uh, encourage anybody who might be listening to come to the town hall, right? That's, that's a really big deal, the next meeting. I don't know how many people are online. We can't see that from our place here, but please come to the town hall. I'm sure we'll be discussing that here tonight. So thank you. Council Member Sharpenow, what do you have for us tonight? Test, test. Thank you for, there we go. Thank you. Council Member Sharpenow, you want to try again? You drew the short straw tonight, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. We're waiting for more, <laughs> an encore. <laughs> Council Member Lakotia, I guess you're gonna be Ms. Uh, Council Member Charbonneau's encore. <laughs> yeah, it does. I just wanted to make a, just a small suggestion if that's okay with Everybody, if it's not, that's fine too. Uh, given that we bring always bring our devices, um, if we can just do away with the paper copy of the agenda and plan, you know, the planning calendar, just you can go a little green here and go paperless. Um, if needed, you can also flash it on the screens that we have, uh, and it'll save time for our staff to do all those printouts. Uh, the other thing um, I just wanted to um, kind of suggest not for now, but we should think through of uh, creating some metrics. Uh, if we can have, uh, you know, like maybe monthly, once a month, we can look at some metrics, we can all brainstorm of what kind of metrics we should look at this. You know, for example, something like turnaround time for permits, or we, we can come up with, you know, the different areas of, uh, it just gives us a pulse of the city, how we are doing. So, um, and I, I will kind of sit down and uh, think, think through some, and all of us can do that and at some point and maybe look at it regularly now that we have a new leader uh, in the staff. So uh, probably we can come up with some new ideas. And the, um, uh, lastly, um, uh, I know during uh, city manager comments, if we can just um, discuss about town hall. I know we haven't talked about it, and it's coming up in the next meeting, what the format will be. Um, uh, what the agenda is going to be, what kind of questions we're going to ask uh, the uh, uh, the citizens, because I believe they could do live vote 
and uh, I think we also have some kind of a touch pads, uh, you know, uh, last time, last when they had in-person town hall. Uh, but there's also a website poll now. Uh, we can put our questions in there and then the citizens can, you know, because since everybody has cell phones, they all can do live voting if needed. So at some point today, if we can just like briefly discuss what the town hall whole deal is going to be, what the agenda and everything is going to be about. That's all I had. Council Member Velasenor. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to highlight some local student athletes. I am currently uh, on the Hazen Booster Club. Uh, I'm the parent for golf. And I wanted to highlight a number of local student athletes uh, from both Hazen High School and Liberty High School who will be playing uh, in the state tournament, uh, state golf tournament next week um, um, in the girls state tournament. Uh, I mention this because one of the, those golfers does live at my house. <laughs> but I, I also see so many of the students who are doing more than just going to school. They're participating in clubs. They're active in the community. They're, they're athletes. Uh, they spend so much time and effort building, you know, building their communities into more than they are today. And, and I wanted to appreciate them for that. So to all the students, uh, especially student athletes who are competing this spring, good luck. And to all those who are graduating soon, uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you. All right, and good luck to your golfer at home. Council Member Griffin, go ahead, please. We uh, need to emphasize the town hall meeting. We haven't had one in three years. So uh, we need to get the people out to where they can participate in it. We've been talking about it for uh, at least two or three years. And uh, without having to have one, we need to really try to make this a big event. So uh, we need to get our people out to the town hall. Thank you. All right, Deputy Mayor Sherlock, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mayor Nguyen. Um, yes, I also have on my list town hall. <laughs> um, June 7th starts at 6 p.m. at the golf club. We hope to see you there for refreshments and mingling, and you can ask staff questions, what's going on uh, in City Hall, and then at 7 p.m. we'll sit down and um, talk about ARPA, where we're at, and um, take a lot of, hopefully a lot of questions for the council. So I'm excited to see people there, and uh, put it on your calendar, please. Um, the only other thing I had was um, I was sent the information for our former mayor, Jean Garber's memorial service, which is going to be held um, at Lake Warren Park at picnic shelter number two by the tennis courts on Saturday, June 18th from 3 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. So um, I'm sure that um, Kate can probably put that in the newsletter, but I just wanted to get that on record for everybody. So thank you to Claudia Hershey for sending that out. All right. Thank you, and I just removed that tribute to former mayor and council member Garber from my list, so that is covered. So just wanted to touch on a couple more things, moving on to item seven, mayor's report. Uh, Memorial Day weekend coming up. Gosh, I think we wait from New Year's Day to Memorial Day weekend, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of summer. Um, cemetery tour, the Historicalist Society will be hosting a cemetery tour. I believe the dates are Sunday and Monday of Memorial Day weekend. A um, couple of very special thanks to volunteers in our city. Planning Commissioner Kurt Utterback is actually um, relocating out of the city and wanted to thank him for his six years of service to the Planning Commission and all of the valuable input he has added to um, that commission with his experience in uh, co commercial real estate leasing and just his expertise in so many areas. So thank you, Mr. Utterback. Also wanted to thank a very, very, very long time volunteer who recently resigned from the Community Activities Commission. And I also had the pleasure of serving with her on that commission in 2013 through 2015. Um, and that's Diane Lewis, and 20 years of volunteering for that commission 
initially as the Parks Commission in 2003, later converted to the Community Activities Commission in 2013, where the charter was adjusted to add community events under their umbrella. Um, and we're all looking forward to those summer events coming back. So thank you to Ms. Lewis. Truly appreciate your service. 20 years is a long time to volunteer. So uh, she'll have lots of free time coming up, I'm sure. Um, other than that, I believe that checks all the items on my list. Council committee reports. Any, uh, I know we received the MISWAC report today via email. Thank you, Council Member Clark. Anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, no, just if you have questions, please let me know. I sent that out and uh, yeah, pretty routine. Thank you. Any other reach? Uh, Council Member Charbonneau, go ahead, please. Um, yeah, as well, please, uh, for if there's any questions for Eastside Transportation Partnership, please let me know. Um, it's not very, uh, I'm not reporting on many votes. It's not really a committee that takes votes on items. It's more they give us briefings and then allow us to ask questions. Um, they briefed us on a new safety, security, and fair enforcement reform initiative, I'm trying to collect uh, fares now that we're uh, kind of moving past the pandemic phase and sort of outline their goals on climate action moving forward and their ambitious goal for zero emission transit, which they're actively working towards. And if anyone wants to get into more nuance on that, please let me know. Thank you, and my apologies. I'm kind of combining the council committee reports with the regional committee, so I apologize for that. Um, so I'm going to just jump to Council Member Villa Senior. Do you have a finance committee update for us? Finance committee meets tomorrow, actually, um, due to scheduling things. So um, I will have more to say on it, um, perhaps the next meeting. Thank you very much. All right, any other committees we've missed? All right, thanks everyone for contributing to those committees. Planning Commission and Community Activities Commission reports are included in your packet. Neither of the chairs were able to be here tonight, but we do have staff on hand if there are any questions. So Planning Commission, we have Director Iskathorpe, and I believe um, Ms. Langsdorf is in the audience virtually, is that true? Oh. <laughs> if there are any co questions for either of those individuals. There's a moment I need to promote her to the panel. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? I think we're okay. Thank you both very much. All right. Um, city manager report. I apologize because I should have introduced <laughs> interim city manager Bob Larson at the beginning of the meeting and totally meant to. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for being here in Newcastle for a few months to... You know, spend the summer with us, maybe, and um, you get a debut report here tonight. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor, and council members, and members of the audience. I uh, had the good fortune of having a city manager report already submitted for me when I got here. So thanks, staff, for doing all that hard work. I really appreciate it. And any any questions about what's in the report, uh, please don't hesitate to ask about it. But I do want to just speak just briefly to the public works week. I I would be with uh, hopefully the. Staff tomorrow, Jeff's going to take me out to the annex, and uh, I want to make sure I, we recognize them for all their hard, con hard earned contributions and hard earned work that they've uh, submitted to the city. Great service. I, I'm just astonished at how much work it's done by. I saw the staff this morning out on the, in the I think Newport Way here, doing some trimming and stuff, and just uh, going at it bright and early. I really do appreciate that. The city looks really nice. I also just wanted to say that uh, I'm looking forward to my engagement here with the city, working with the uh, members of the council, the mayor, staff, and as well as the community. It's a, I think it's a, it's a very uh, well-run city, and they've got uh, folks who really put a lot of effort into it. And I do want to recognize the employees as well as the council members who, who work so hard at this. I, I was able to witness the last two meetings you had, and there's a lot of good deliberation that's going on. So I'm looking forward to this, and uh, I'll do my best to uh, try to fill what was, uh, I think, going to be a very difficult task, and that's the former manager, Rob Wyman. So he uh, did a great work, did work, work here, and I think he's uh, going to be truly missed. So with that, I'll turn it back to the mayor. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager Larson. All right, that brings us to approval of the consent agenda. 
Motion to approve. I'll move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All right, it's been moved by Council or by Deputy Mayor Sherlock, seconded by Council Member Clark, I believe that was, to approve the consent agenda. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Moving on. Public hearings. We have no public hearings. We have no unfinished business. We are up to item 11.1, general business, which is adoption of resolution 2022-905, approval of Heemstra Assemblage Preliminary Plan. I believe we have Director Eisgerthorpe and is Planner Aaron Fitzgibbons joining us. Welcome. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Oh, this, Carol Simpson was right. This is scary. If, <laughs> so, if, if I could, be, before we have the, the presentation. My, um, my fault. No, that, that's quite all right. I, I would just like to address the council real quickly. Uh, remind everybody that this is a quasi-judicial hearing, um, which uh, means that the doctrine of um, the appear, appearance of fairness um, applies. So the process has to be fair, and it needs to appear that the decision makers are fair as well. I'm going to go through and ask some questions um, of everybody to make sure that uh, the appearance of fairness doctrine is, is abided by tonight. I'm going to start with a general question for everybody and, and ask if anybody has a personal interest in the property or owns property within 300 feet of the subject application. And if so, just go ahead and raise your hand. All right, and then a second question I have is uh, if anybody will have has any financial gain or loss related to the project, and if you do, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, and then uh, I'd like to go through individually and ask everybody uh, individually a couple of questions. Uh, let's start with uh, you, Councilmember Clark. Uh, Councilmember Clark, can you hear and consider this application in a fair and objective manner? Yes. And have you engaged in any ex parte communications since the time this application was submitted to the hearing examiner and today? No, I have not. Thank you, Councilmember Clark. Councilmember Charbonneau, may I ask you a couple of questions? Right. Councilmember Charbonneau, can you hear and consider the application in a fair and objective manner? Yes. All right. And have you engaged in any ex parte communications between the time this application was submitted to the hearing examiner and today? I have not. Thank you. Councilmember Lakotia, may I ask you a couple of questions? Yes. Thank you. Are you able to hear and consider the application in a fair and objective manner? Yes. And have you engaged in any ex parte communications on this application between the time it was submitted to the hearing examiner and today? No, I have not. Thank you. Councilmember Villasenor, may I ask you a couple of questions? Yes, please. All right. Uh, are, are you able to hear and consider this application in a fair and objective manner? Yes. And have you engaged in the ex parte communications between the time this application was submitted to the hearing examiner and today? No. Thank you. Councilmember Griffin, may I ask you a couple questions? Yes. All right. Are you able to hear and consider the application in a fair and objective manner? Yes. And have you engaged in any ex parte communications related to the application between the time it was submitted to the hearing examiner and today? No. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Sherlock, may I ask you a couple questions? Yes. All right. Are you able to hear and consider the application in a fair and objective manner? Yes. Right. And have you engaged in any ex parte communications on the application between the time it was submitted to the hearing examiner and today? No, I was invited to meet with people and I politely declined. Thank you. <laughs> Mayor Nguyen, may I ask you a couple questions? Yes, sir. All right. Are you able to hear and consider the application in a fair and objective manner? Yes, sir. Okay, and uh, did you engage in any ex parte communications related to the application between the time it was submitted to the hearing examiner and today? No, sir, but similar to Deputy Mayor Sherlock, I was contacted um, by Mr. McDuff, I believe his name was, and I, again, declined as well. Um, at this time, um, if anybody would like to make an attempt to um, challenge any of the council members for violating the Appearance Affairs Doctrine, now is your opportunity to do so. Okay, no, uh, no challenges. Thank you. Now I'll turn it over to you. Hi, good evening. Nice to see you all in person. Um, well, for the few of you who have been uh, present for the entirety of this project's progression, my presentation on. Oh, 
that's fine. Um, my presentation uh, may seem a little bit repetitive from the previous ones. However, the goal tonight is to present the pertinent aspects of the preliminary plat review. For those who are joining us tonight and might not be familiar with this project, this is the Heemstra Assemblage Preliminary Plat. DR Horton is the applicant and the project is managed by Kathy Orney from DR Horton. There are three owners among the six parcels that make up this lot, um, the Mellinger, Heemstra, and Chin families. There are a number of related permits, including a development agreement that was approved by city council in March and a boundary line adjustment that was approved by the director in April. We anticipate an engineering review permit and subsequent building permits, as well as final plat um, to come in the future. Um, this is an area of the city that has seen quite a bit of activity. The assemblage is located um, near three other developments under recent construction, Foxwoods Rhododendron Ridge, which is also called Hazelwood Gardens, um, as well as the Enclave. The closest subdivision is Elizabeth Estates, and it is immediately to the north. Just to remind ourselves, um, here's the site plan. You can see the homes are clustered to the east, and uh, which allows more space for the park areas to the west. Um, there is a new public road, shown as Road A and B, um, which will be dedicated to the city. Steep slopes, there are some steep slopes on the site. You can see those uh, in this sort of square hatching. Um, <clears throat> the actual slopes are all within the wetland buffers and the applicant has provided the minimum 50 foot buffer for each of these steep slopes. In one location, a trail will pass through one of the steep slopes, uh, but this is uh, permissible under NMC 1824-300. Uh, without uh, repeating too much information that has already been provided, staff have found that the applicant is providing a great improvement to the wetland and ooh, buffer um, functions considering the amount of enhancement that they are doing to all of these, uh, what are now existing pony pastures. The enhancement is being provided uphill of the stream. So the stream is here. All of the enhancement is in this sort of horizontal hatching. Um, so downstream or downhill from the plat and the park, which will help filter any runoff. In terms of significant trees, um, the applicant is actually exceeding the required 25% required. Uh, by 10%, they're retaining 35%. They're actually retaining 14 trees. However, uh, they are gaining extra credit for, gain, for retaining trees that are large in size. Uh, they're retaining this grove of trees, um, which gives them extra credit. And um, they are also, their size, oh, and then they're right next to the uh, wetland buffer here. In terms of uh, traffic, you can see here on this slide, um, this is from the traffic impact analysis. And what you're looking at is the change in level of service without the project and with the project. And it looks like it's downgraded from A to B, but that is really very, whoops, minor in terms of the change. Um, without the project, the delay is 9.8 seconds at the intersection of 83rd and 116th, but it's 10.2 seconds at 83rd and 116th with the project. So it's really only 0.4 seconds. Um, the project is, uh, meets the safe routes to school requirements. Uh, the schools are Risden Middle School, uh, Hazelwood Elementary School, and Hazen High School. Um, the students will be required or are anticipated to walk to the middle school. There's a bus stop across the street for the elementary school and the high school. And all of this meets the requirements of safe routes to school. In terms of 83rd Street improvements, um, the one notable thing is that there is an existing um, temporary turnaround easement that will extinguish with the plat. However, they are going to still have to retain some sort of access here for utilities that CCUD and the city own. 
Um, so that we don't have final design on that yet, but that will likely be some bollards and a driveway apron. Um, and just so you can see that's here on this north end. Um, 83rd Street will be a local access street, so we'll load a road A and road B. That means there are sidewalks on both sides and landscape strips of the streets um, and only parking on one side. There will also be um, this track dedicated to the city, which is approximately, I wrote it down, um, and I just changed the slide again, didn't I? A 36 feet at its narrowest point. Looking at 116th Avenue, um, that's on the, as you know, on the eastern side of the flat. The improvements will go down here to the southeastern corner. They're providing enough uh, right of way dedication to make the full arterial width. Plus, there's going to be another uh, landscaping tract here, tract K, which is approximately 44 feet. Um, they are going to be meeting, therefore, the public work standards for a collect an arterial, uh, collector arterial. Oh boy. Uh, there's not much to say about the street trees other than the fact that the applicant is meeting their requirements. Utilities will all be undergrounded. Um, they will be running through the road and then they will, um, all the uh, stormwater will go to a vault that is under the active portion of the park. Uh, the actual playground is back here. Um, so this is all that green space in the overlook. Um, there is also a 10 foot dry utility easement along the frontages. Next slide, come on, here we go. Um, as you all know, there have been a lot of public comments on this project. Um, there were residents from the Elizabeth Estates uh, and their concerns were outlined in the hearing examiner's report. They also commented at the public hearing. In response to comments, the hearing examiner did add a condition of approval that a site obscuring fence or vegetation be located along the boundary between the park and Mr. Van Norman's property, which is Elizabeth Estates Lot 11. Um, there are some additional unique conditions. Um, First is the CCNRs will require parking on the lots first to utilize those four parking spots that we heard about before, um, the approval of the BLA. And then the hearing examiner added on these ones that are in orange, which is um, to include the landscaping fence and also to exclude Southeast 83rd Street from construction traffic and also preparation of an archeological survey. The archeological survey is actually almost complete, if not complete at this point, and um, we were already planning on excluding construction traffic, so that's just um, put into writing now. So with that, uh, I've brought the hearing examiner's recommendation for approval, um, and I will hand it back over to you. Thank you very much. Council, any questions for Ms. Fitzgibbons? Council Member Clark, go ahead. Um, could you explain extra credit? What does that mean? I'm sorry, I haven't heard about that before. Is it, are they getting something or what, what's going on there with extra credit? Yeah, so um, per our code, when the significant trees, we're talking about significant trees here. Where did they go? There they are. Um, so you can see that like there's this grouping of Douglas firs and because there are five or more with the drip line overlapping one another, um, they get an extra tree retention credit. So they get, instead of one credit, they get two. The same thing goes through for trees of certain width and height, depending on the kind of tree, if it's um, coniferous or if it's deciduous. And then also, um, if you're within 25 feet of a wetland boundary, you also get an extra point. And it's, it's just one extra point per tree that meets these criterion. And if I may, I might say that I, I think there's some good rationale behind that because when you're clearing a site and you expose trees, they're far more vulnerable to, to wind, to blow over, and things like that. When you save a cluster of trees, they support each other, and so the likelihood of their survival is greatly increased. It's, it's just more of a, of a, you know, a, a strong uh, landscape statement as well. Um, so um, 
and, and it's code based, by the way. It's nothing that, that's anything extra they're asking for. That's a specific provision in the code. So. Council Member Alcotia, go ahead, yeah, just please. Quick question. What do they do with the extra credit? Like, what is it used for? Sorry, turn on my mic here. Um, so when they, uh, they get, you have to retain 25% of the trees on the site. And so in this instance, they saved um, 70, there's 79 in the developable area, but developable area, and they retained 14 physical trees. But they take that extra credit and we apply it towards the percentage retained. So um, my instant math skills are not the best, but so 14 out of seven, instead of 14 out of 79, it was basically 28 out of, 40, of 79 were considered retained. I just, oh, Council Member Sharpen, I'll go ahead, please. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Planner Fritz Gibbons. Um, I was curious, could you speak to, because I know that the side of 116th Ave that's closer to the preliminary plat is sort of, uh, doesn't have a sidewalk. Um, I was curious if you could speak to the walkability. And then I was really curious to your perspective on, we have the infrastructure going in sort of near exit seven for transportation um, in the future. Would there be any um, means for folks that would live in this area to um, access that besides walking down from a pedestrian perspective besides walking down that like giant hill? Mm -hmm. um, let me see if I can get through this like plan here. Sorry, clearly I'm used to talking to drawings. Um, okay, so, oh, um, so you're talking about the sidewalk that's here currently on the east, on the western side? Yeah. So there's going to be, there's a four-way stop here, and that'll be continued on 84th. So when we're looking at, like, safe routes to school, that will continue to go all the way up. Um, and that's what they'll be using in terms of walkability. Um, and then the sidewalk will be continued on the western side to help increase walkability on the west side. Um, and then in terms of access to um, exit seven improvements, other than walking down the trail down 80th Street, um, we don't have any planned at this point that I'm aware of. Director Bronze, I don't know if you know of anything. No. No, there's a trail, excuse me, the Heemstra, the, there's a trail that goes through east to west and Heemstra has planned to connect to a development in the city of Renton to the east, excuse me, to the west. Um, but that's the, and that would connect down to improvements on Monterey, but that's the only non-motorized path way that would exist. There's, there's not a, well, as another related agenda item tonight, there's um, a sidewalk connection. So you could connect on the existing easterly 116th sidewalk and then continue down to Southie May Creek Park Drive. And there's some segments of sidewalk, but it is not continuous all the way down to exit seven. I just have a couple of very quick questions, um, pretty benign actually. But you'd mentioned the school routes and there's a bus service for the elementary students, not the middle school students. Is that age, is it locale? Uh, can you touch on that a little bit? And I know that's 100% school district and we don't have any jurisdiction over that, but I, we're just looking for a clarification. Yeah, I think um, from what I can infer from working on different projects, it's, it's distance and age. Okay. Um, so um, Risen Middle School is less than a mile away, so you must think of for a certain age. And if you have anything to add, do you have anything? Oh, okay. Um, then we would, um, I'm sorry, for distance and age. So basically it's less than a mile, so for that age group it's appropriate. Maybe if it were closer even, I've seen that elementary school students are sometimes anticipated to walk. Okay, that makes sense. And then my other question is, um, I don't live too far, but I live beyond the 300 feet, just to clarify. <laughs> um, so we have been through a, quite a bit of, I, you know, I estimate it's probably utility work along 116th that has been installed because there's been a lot of development around there. And they just cleaned up the road and they got it all paved very nicely again. So I'm hoping we don't have to tear up 116th again. Can you address that? Yeah, I can or. Go ahead. Um, 
Well, I'll, I'll try and then Director Bronze can take over. But um, they will have to do some work in the amount of, you know, they're gonna be tying into all the utilities and bringing them into the site. So I anticipate that they would be um, tearing up some portion of 116th again. Is that? My understanding, so they just recently, last week, repaved um, uh, following Puget Sound Energy gas line work and they left out the 116th Southeast 84th intersection because I believe that was where, that's where the utility tie-ins are gonna be for this development. Excellent, thank you. So other than the 84th intersection vicinity, there should not be any other disturbance and not the area that was just repaved. Okay, thank you so much. And just clear, that paving was done at no cost to the city. Good job. So uh, uh, Assistant City situation. Engineer Kerry Sullivan got them, they were gonna just patch the areas and he said, no, 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 you're gonna do a half street all the way the length. Oh, so. they did a horrible patch job initially. <laughs> it's so much nicer and I appreciate that. <laughs> all right, any further questions? Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Fitzgibbons. Uh, in motion, I'll call for any motions out there, please. Council Member Villasenor, go ahead, please. I move adoption of resolution 2022-905, Heemstra Assemblage Preliminary Plat, as, rec as recommended by the hearing examiner. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, it's been moved by Council Member Villasenor, seconded by Deputy Mayor Sherlock, to adopt resolution 2022-905, Heemstra Assemblage Preliminary Plat, as recommended by the hearing examiner. All in favor, please say aye. I opposed. Eyes have it. Seven zero. Thank you. Moving on to item eleven dot two. Excuse me, Madam Mayor. I'm sorry to interrupt. I sorry. have a motion I'd like to make at this point. If I may, please. Councilmember Clark. Thank you. I make a motion. Excuse me. I make a motion that we direct the Public Works Department to install speed humps on Southeast Eighty Third Street, concurrent with the street widening for the Heemstra development. Second. Sure, sure. This is City Clerk Paul White. So the, the question ha has to do with the, um, the, the motion, uh, the order of the motion, um, because this particular question is not on the agenda as we just approved it a moment ago. Um, the option would be that we um, include in the motion a waiver of the rules to also to consider it because um, because you have actually, when you when you would uh, approve your agenda for the day, you're agreeing to that list of ac actions, and so something that's different than that would require a rules waiver in order to bring up at that point. Well, I apologize for that. I assumed incorrectly, obviously, that this was related. So we'll continue at continuation. So that that's my unawareness of the rules. So, Madam Mayor, if yes. I may, just okay. So that's that's an interesting uh, point, Council Member, and I think that um, not that I'm recommending that you should have done it this way, <laughs> but another way in which that might have been made a subsidiary question would have been to have offered it as an amendment to the actual resolution. However, um, that is also there's also some. Um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for, Councillor? Uh, uh, issues. issues with with that particular um, uh, course of action, also. So, mainly adding things to um, the uh, the um, uh, recommendation from the hearing examiner brings all sorts of different requirements of, of findings. Uh, but th I, I do agree this could be a separate issue that has nothing to do with the Heemstra plat approval. Or preliminary plan approval. That, that's why I didn't add nine. I knew it was <laughs> one thing or another. 
point of clarification? Uh, just a moment. We're trying to solve this, please. So is the recommendation that we maybe add this to the planning calendar at the end? Or we vote on it now? And, and not only that, I don't have enough information. I mean, do we have fire approval on that kind of thing? So, um, so Madam, Madam Mayor, I, I uh, respect your concerns about, you know, taking the, the course of action uh, without full information, let's say. Um, and it is possible, of course, um, to, to take this action. Um, th th it's, not, it's not necessary to take this action right now in order for this action to be proposed, if that, if that makes sense. In other words, since this is not a subsidiary question to the other item on the agenda, it's not as though this is the only opportunity to do it, if that, if that makes sense to everyone. Um, there are a couple of options available. <laughs> um, the, you, the, the one of one of which I already mentioned, which is to um, waive the rules in order to take up the item. Another is, as you mentioned, to place it on the planning calendar for consideration at a future time. Um, however. The posture at this particular moment is that you have an active motion that has been seconded and it is now up to the body to make a determination about what they want to do with it next. That's where I thought I was, so thank you for the clarification. Um, okay, there's a motion on the floor, uh, moved by Council Member Clark, seconded by Council Member Lakotia to add speed humps to I forgot the roadway. Southeast 83rd Street concurrent with the street widening on, for the Heemster development. Um, Council Member Clark, would you like to speak to your motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I apologize for the procedural, you know, confusion. That was not my intention. So I will learn from my experiences. So this, this issue, <clears throat> um, it's actually near and dear to my heart because this was an issue in, in the Hazelwood where I lived at the time. And I know that the residents on Southeast 83rd Street have brought this up in public comment. They brought it up to the hearing examiner according to the report and it's important to them. And now um, <clears throat> this is the perfect time to do this, right? All the trucks are gonna be there. Everything will be mobilized. There won't be an extra cost to get manpower. They'll already have asphalt. They just gotta bring another load of asphalt in and and spend a little more man hours to, to add this. So it's a minimal cost. It's the perfect time to do this if we're gonna do it. And I think it's important to heed the uh, requests of, of the citizens in the street. They, they are very concerned. They got this development, you know, they weren't expecting. And of course, they, that's, that's unfortunate for them, but they are asking for a reasonable accommodation. And the speed humps are, are a very reasonable accommodation uh, at minimal cost if we do it now while the development is being built and the road is being widened. And I, I'm gonna address some concerns that will be brought up after I'm done. And one of the concerns is, and I respect greatly Director Bronze and his staff, but uh, he will say that this is not necessary and we have not done this before in developments, but I will argue uh, simply that we in the Hazelwood community fought for three years to get speed humps and every speed study through the neighborhood showed there was no issue, right? But we lived there and we could tell you that people were speeding through the neighborhoods. And now that the speed humps are in there, they're not speeding. So that's a visual learned experience uh, despite what the studies would have shown and did show. So <clears throat> um, I understand this is not a normal and some might be worried about we're opening up a floodgate, everybody's gonna want speed humps. That I, don't, I don't think that's the case. I think in this case, the residents were very specific. It's a very reasonable, low cost solution to do it now while the equipment is mobilized and we take care of their concerns and uh, we make sure that we don't have to come back and address this in the future after we perhaps are proven wrong about speeding on that street. Thank you. Okay, and just a reminder, it was brought to my attention at our last meeting that we do have um, a limit on our council uh, remarks as well, or when they're speaking about an item according to our policies. Council Member Lakota, you seconded it. Anything to add? I'm sorry, Mayor Ring, I didn't understand it. Um, 
I, you, we just need to be mindful of time while we're, we're speaking. We do have a, it is in our policies. Uh, go ahead, council member. No, I'll be quick. Uh, I think it's a simple ask and it's going to be efficient because the workers and you know the construction people will already be there. So um, I think we can easily accommodate uh, simple ads for, for our citizens. Okay, any further comments, discussion? Council Member Villasenor, go ahead, please. Um, I just want to get some clarification. We're gonna ask the developer to add these speed bumps, correct? Uh, we are not. This would be a city cost because the developer or the hearing examiner has ruled that, that these are not necessary. That's his opinion. And so uh, we, you know, we can't go and say, well, the, you have to do it now. The hearing examiner said you don't. So this, that's why I'm suggesting that we do it now for the city because it will be a very minimal expense to the city at this time. The equipment's already there. They're already working on the road. Okay. So, um, so my my ask before I would vote yes on this would be able to to see it, just a cost breakdown, of of what it would take to have that done. So, while I'm happy to consider the motion or the the idea. At a later time, I don't feel like I have enough information at this time to go forward. So thank you. Okay, anyone else? Council Member Griffin, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mayor Newing. Uh, if the uh, city is not going to do it, could we ask the uh, developer to do it and then charge the city for the minimal amount of putting it in there? It would be a lot less than having the city go out and uh, sit to the developers going to do the streets, are they not? So if they're going to do that, then uh, if there's a charge that needs to be billed back to the city, I would think that this would be the time to do it rather than send the city trucks out there to put speed bumps in at a later date. Thank you. That was my intention. Anyone else? Oh, Deputy Mayor Sherlock, go ahead, please. Uh, can can we? I have the similar concerns to Councilmember Bill Senor that we don't really have specific information. I'm not saying I wouldn't be open to this idea in the future, but do we, Director Brahms, do you have any idea on how much this would cost or? Well, separate from the co cost, I think they're about 15,000, the speed hump based on, that's my recollection, but it doesn't really work that way. Uh, this is private development putting in the infrastructure and I don't know that we can reimburse them for work that would be, because when the city does improvements, it's considered a public work and there's different requirements, um, brings in, the legislative requirements for prevailing wages and things like that. So I don't think, I'm trying to think of if there's been an example like that where we've reimbursed them for a private entity for doing work and I don't think it works that way. Is this something we can, I know we're talking about uh, our capital improvement project soon. Is this something we can? Well, just... this wouldn't be, this would, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely not in favor of this. Um, but we, if we do, do install speed humps, they're not, it, it falls below the CIP levels. Just we put it under our T10, our traffic calming budget. And so that's a, that's a project that's already on yes. the capital improvement plan? Correct. Correct. Okay. It would not be its own individual project. So how does that work? When does that, when do you decide where to put stuff like that? Um, it's generally staff uh, responds to either problems or if a re request comes in for this particular quarter then we'll set out traffic counts and, and try and validate if there's a concern or not. That's the that's my main concern here is that we're in my opinion putting the car before the horse of course we don't know if there's gonna be an issue. Speed humps are um, for everybody that's in favor of them there you've got people that are opposed to them there's just a recent uh, chat on the community Facebook page a couple weeks ago about that and there was uh, vocal commentary on both sides of that. Um, and I don't, you know, the, the, the neighborhood that Councilmember Clark talked about, that's a local connector roadway. So it's a, it's a roadway that's used for people connecting from point A to point B. And this new development, Southeast City Third, is not. Nobody's going to use it except for, well, there's the park. But um, it's just still a different type of situation, in my opinion, about traffic patterns. Okay. If, the, if the council decides to do that, we can do that. But it would be um, after the development is completed. Because if the, the other thing is if we do work, um, the developers, the road is under warranty, and basically kind of once you touch it, then the, I'm not sure if the warranty would still be valid. They have a two-year maintenance and defect budget, or um, bond, 
excuse me, not budget. And so that goes from once the city accepts the improvements, then the count, then the uh, roadway improvements and sidewalk and curb and gutter and stormwater systems are under a two-year maintenance and defect period that the developer is responsible to correct any issues that arise. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna call for the vote. Um, the, there's a motion on the floor to direct the Public Works Department to install a speed pumps on Southeast 83rd Street concurrent with the street widening for the Heapster development. A uh, motion was made by Council Member Clark, seconded by Council Member Lakotia. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Yeah. No. Motion fails three to four with Council Members Clark. Griffin and Lakotia have voted in favor of the motion. Okay, moving on to item number 11.2. Adoption of resolution 2022-903 Southeast May Creek Park Drive non-motorized improvement project T047. Director Bronze, I believe this belongs to you. Uh, yes, thank you. I need to, uh, Clerk White, I need to share the screen, is that correct? So you can see that the screen, the PowerPoint. Okay. All right. So before you, we have a uh, a construction bid award for the capital project T forty seven, which is non motorized improvements on Southeast May Creek Park Drive. And non motorized, I just think bike and ped bikes and pedestrians. It's a sidewalk and a bike lane. So to orient you to the project. This is a kind of an oblique aerial photo. Um, north is, that's once with the, the arrow that north is on, that's 116th Avenue Southeast. So the corridor, May Creek, May Creek Park Drive. The project was a week, uh, broken into two parts. And the way we do this is we call it a base bid. So that's the, the core of the project. And then we do things like a bid additive to see, it gives the, the, the city uh, flexibility in ch choosing which of the options to bid. So in this case, the area indicated in red, um, which runs from just west of 116th Avenue Southeast to 121st Avenue Southeast, which is the entrance to the Wintry neighborhood, and that was the base bid. And uh, I'll get into what the uh, elements are of those. I just, this will just orient the uh, location. And then the area um, in blue that kind of, if you're familiar with May Creek Park Drive, as you're heading west towards Interstate 405, the road shortly after 116th, the roadway shifts to the left and then goes downhill. And right at that point where it curves to the south, that's where the transition is from the base bid to the bid additive. And so here's a here's a plan view looking at that. Um, 116th is is right here, just slightly left of center. And the base bid is the area shown in yellow, and that is improvements on the north side of the roadway, and that is con a sidewalk. Uh, planter strip in most locations, and then a bike lane on the north side of the roadway. So the bid additive, what that does is adds a bike lane on the south side or the eastbound direction. And the um, prime benefit here is that's coming up the hill. So cyclists coming up the hill from, from the city of Renton will benefit from the bike lane because when you're traveling uphill, you want to be out of the direction of traffic. Whereas in this location, going downhill, you'll be able to travel similar to the vehicle speeds. And another pictorial, this is the, the existing conditions throughout the corridor, two travel lanes and a narrow shoulder. And the proposed improvements on the base bid are to construct the improvements on the north side, so that would be the left side, um, consisting of a sidewalk, a planter strip in most locations, and then a bike lane. And then the bit, the bit additive, the section to the west, would be constructing that uphill bike lane on the south side of the roadway. So the bids were received. Um, the engineer's estimate is one, approximately $1.5 million for the base bid and about $290,000 for the bid additive for a total of $1.84 million. We had healthy competition on the project. We received six bids, and the low bid was submitted by R.W. Scott for a total of $1.67 million for the base bid and uh, $369,000 for the bid additive for a grand total of $2.04 million. RW Scott, we've worked with them before. They're a very good contractor to work with. They constructed most recently the sidewalk on 129th Avenue Southeast, um, just south of City Hall. So I um, just want to ask that 
I'm just going to have a couple of questions that council members might be considering um, for this this request. First, does the city still want to construct these improvements? And I would say the answer is still yes. Um, does the city have the funding to construct the project? Yes, we do. And then lastly, will the cost to construct this project go down in the future? And that is no. Um, there are times where you know we've had spikes on drywall or different type of raw materials where if you just wait it out, then you know it's like a couple years ago it was not a time to build a deck because decking was in short supply. But this the costs are driven here by just the um, inflation, everything in inflating right now. Uh, the inflation rate will hopefully go down, but it will still be in a positive direction. So the project will be more expensive to build in the future. So I will, uh, here's the recommended motion. I'm happy to entertain any questions or discuss this further. Thank you, Director Bronze. Council Member Charbonneau, go ahead, please. I move to adopt resolution 2022-903, awarding the construction base bid plus the bid additive for the Southeast Maid Creek Park Drive West non-motorized improvement project T-047 to RW Sky Construction Company in the amount not to exceed $2,036,864.00 and authorizing the city manager to execute the contract. Second. All right, it's been moved by Council Member Charbonneau, seconded by Council Member Clark to adopt resolution 2022-903, awarding the construction base bid plus the bid additive for that the Southeast May Creek Park Drive West non-motorized improvement project T047 to RW Scott Construction Company in the amount not to exceed $2,036,864 and authorizing the city manager to execute the contract as presented in Exhibit 3. Council Member Charbonneau, would you like to speak to your motion? Thank you. Um, I think this is a great use of uh, funds, specifically capital improvement funds and REIT funds for improving the walkability of our city. That is a specific area that is not, frankly, safe to walk. I've heard it from many residents. I've experienced it myself. I've taken out my headphones when I've walked those portions before because I, I just want to be con con uh, conscious of it. Um, I we really commend Jeff and the Public Works Department for doing this work and putting this forward. I think this is exactly what we should be using capital improvement for. I think it's a very forward thinking um, plan and it corrects sort of what I think is a current, honestly, safety issue for pedestrians in our city. So I would uh, emphatically support it. Council Member Clark, anything to add? Well, he almost said verbatim what I would have said. So I agree. <laughs> um, I will never be opposed to improving our infrastructure. So. Uh, if we can afford to do so. So this is a good example of that, and I approve. All right. Motion on the floor to adopt resolution 2022-903, awarding the construction-based bid plus the bid additive for the Southeast May Creek Park Drive West non-motorized improvement project T-047 to RW Scott Construction Company in the amount not to exceed $2,036,864 and authorizing the city manager to execute the contract as presented in Exhibit 3. Motion made by Council Member Charbonneau, seconded by Council Member Clark. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Congratulations, Mr. Bronze. You have another project. Thank you very much. Just when busy you thought you were running out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, moving on to item 11.3. That is ARPA funding priorities. Uh, we have seen this i believe this is the seventh time now and our list still stands firm at 14. my thoughts on this is i do not want to overwhelm the public bringing this entire list to our town hall i think there are some unattainable things on this list and what i am asking council members to do is to give me your top three to four items to remove from the list in hopes we can reach a consensus tonight on what we'll bring forward to the town hall so we can talk further with our constituents about the importance of investing these ARPA funds to a point where it will enhance amenities, businesses, and our overall community and make this a, a better place to live than what we've already known it to be. We can still 
There's a lot of low-hanging fruit we can grab here. And this is a one-time shot to invest. And um, I will ask for volunteers. First, if they'd like to volunteer, Deputy Mayor Sherlock, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mayor Newing. Um, I took up what Council Member Clark asked of us last meeting and took some time to go through um, the 14 funding options that um, we're kind of at where we're at right now and think about why or why not we would support those. And um, so I put together my plan. It's, it's totally up for discussion. I'm not trying to force anything on anyone, but um, just to give you an idea of my thinking. So if everyone's okay with that, I would love to just go through it really quickly. And if Director Broadus could display that, thank you so much. All right, and I just want to point out that Deputy Mayor Sherlock has um, done a really good job of numbering each of the items, you know, similar to what we presented by management partners. Um, and in our um, discussion, or actually we may even ask you to submit three of your removals to our city clerk on a, a piece of paper, and then he will tally them and read them um, tonight. Uh, but those are, will be the numbers we'll refer to by the um, project name. Go ahead. Okay, so again, this is just my kind of take on it for right now, but I'm, I'm open to discussion and, and uh, tweaking things. Um, so just going to go down the list. So the first one, um, I think we all know what that is, the business and community group grants. Um, I am very much in favor of those. We've heard um, a lot from the community and why those are important. Um, I had crossed off the senior and youth programs. Just honestly, I'd love to hear what other people think about this. I was, I think, kind of um, kind of what Councilmember Clark was saying about outdoor gathering areas at the last meeting. It's like, I don't really know what that mean to me. I don't know what that means. Uh, it, I am a little worried. I wrote down that this could generate ongoing expenditures. So that's why I crossed it off. Um, Number three, um, I think outdoor gathering areas, just thinking of what we lost in COVID, this was important to, to me and my list. And I spoke with um, staff and asked, because there was quite a big range on that, what, what could we actually do with a certain amount of money? Because uh, when you start adding these up, you get to 2.4 million pretty quickly. <laughs> um, so I was told that for about 500,000, we could potentially fix the stage, create some sort of amphitheater at Lake Bourne. Um, I put potential for a return on investment because maybe we would rent that out in the future. I know it wouldn't generate a lot, but something. Um, number four, economic development marketing. Um, this to me, and the next four, five, and six kind of could be grouped together, uh, in my opinion, because they're all investing in our businesses, small businesses in downtown area, um, trying to get more people to stop and spend money at our uh, businesses. And uh, so that's why they, to me, they all have potential for return on investment because they would be um, having people spend more money, which means more sales tax revenue and which means um, businesses are doing better, but also the city benefits from that in the end. So uh, I can go into those more if you have more questions, but that's, uh, and again, that's where my thinking is on supporting those. The downtown improvements one was another one that had a big range, and I spoke with staff, and uh, 300,000 seemed to be a good amount to be able to get signage, um, a lot, letting people know, hey, you're in Newcastle, um, uh, some beautification of the downtown, um, you know, this is all up for debate, but the idea was, you know, with potentially like hanging baskets or um, places where you could put flags if there's like an event going on or there's a holiday and it catches people's attention when they're driving and I may be like, oh, this is cute. I want to stop here for lunch or whatever. Um, possibly uh, another idea I think Director Braun said was like median landscaping along uh, Coal Creek as well. So that's what that money means. Um, number seven, I really love this idea of charging stations. Um, 
like I said, things started adding up and you kind of have to start cutting things. And there are other grant opportunities from the federal infrastructure bill that we could possibly take advantage of for this. And um, I think uh, I'll speak for myself, the idea of incentivizing the downtown um, shopping centers is the goal. <laughs> and so I didn't feel right to put money into having charging stations now when we're really hoping that that will get redeveloped in the near future. So that felt like a little bit of wasting money to spend that money now, but it could happen later. Broad red improvements, I think we kind of talked about that. Um, not, uh, I agree with what Council Member Bill Senor spoke about that last meeting and then also since then, it sounds like there's uh, more opportunities through the federal government to get, um, to get access to, uh, to internet and broadband for low income people. So I crossed that off. So the city facilities maintenance, number nine. I feel strong about this one. I think um, our, uh, the annex needs a lot of help and I think that could really go a long way in improving um, you know, staff, um, where they work and you know, staff morale and better motivation to do a better job. I think it's really important to have a, a nice place to work. So I think this is a good use of this money. Um, and okay, number, the rest I crossed off my list and I'll tell you why. Number 10, stormwater infrastructure. This is a healthy fund. It does not uh, affect the general fund. And I feel strongly that these um, ARPA investment opportunities um, should really go towards um, where we need help. And I just, that's not a place that's healthy. We don't need to spend money there right now. Um, fiscal sustainability. Even if we put all $2.4 million into um, like balancing future budgets, I think that's what this meant. Um, if it's different, please let me know what you're thinking. Um, it wouldn't fix the problem and there's no potential for a return on investment. Number 12, park enhancements. Um, I, I, I'm open to kind of combining outdoor gatherings number three with park enhancements. But we do have a pretty healthy park um, fund. Um, so that's why I crossed that one off. Just got to start cutting somewhere. Um, 13, transportation improvements. This, to me, this is just a completely different conversation to have. ARPA funds wouldn't even be sufficient and we just need to have a really meaningful conversation about that separate from this. And then the last one, city fleet and equipment, I talked to staff and the consensus was this is also a healthy fund and we don't really need to be putting ARPA money there. So that's how I got there. Start off the conversation, questions, concerns? So you, um, we see clearly see which items you removed. Anyone else want to chime in on what they would remove? Uh, Council Member Clark, go ahead, please. Sure. Thank you. Uh, that's outstanding. Thank you. Right. And I'm embarrassed to say that I was looking through my notes and I left my numbers at home, but I have the form with all the 14. So let me go through really quickly. <clears throat> um, so in an attempt to obviously to try to meet in the middle and let us all agree on something, I've you know tried to think about each one more objectively. I'm not opposed to business grants and loans, but I am ab adamant that we have to have a very specific detailed criteria for giving out the money. And we don't have that yet. So I don't have a number put to that because you know I'm not comfortable that we have a way to be fair about this yet. Um, the senior community or the senior center, <clears throat> uh, the biggest problem there is we don't have a place to meet. And for the seniors, um, I really think we should like to do something for the seniors. I saw Mayor Newing had sent out a presentation a couple of weeks ago to us all that has some good ideas. Uh, I'm planning to meet with Director Bronze tomorrow at the annex so he can show me the building. It's probably unlikely we could do anything for seniors there, but I want to understand what we need to do with that building as well. Outdoor gathering areas, I would say no to that. I mean, we have good parks already. People can go to the parks and gather at the parks. Um, people can gather at the outside of the restaurants and so on. I just don't think that uh, is a place we want to put our money right now. 
uh, economic development marketing. My biggest concern, and I wrote this down, my goal from this is to protect our citizens from future inflation, which is crazy. And one of the problems that we have, whether everybody has kept track or not, is we are about $650,000 so far in unexpected expenses this year, right? And it's only the middle of May. So <clears throat> we have to be very cognizant of the fact that we are going to need to take care of ourselves with some of this money at the end of the year. The, uh, so the economic development, the small business technical assistance, I don't know really th that's it's possible there because it doesn't seem like maybe a lot of money there, but I would say no to development marketing. I think it's more important to hold on to our money for the coming financial crisis, which we're already in, essentially. Downtown improvements, promoting tourism. People are not people are worried about where they're going to get groceries and gas right now. They're not going to go looking to spend tourist dollars. It's just a reality. So I don't think that's a place we want to put our money. The charging stations, um, that's an ongoing city cost after we put them in, right? We got to pay for the electricity. And that's, so that's a non-starter for me. Broadband improvements, I echo what uh, Deputy Mayor Sherlock said, you know, and Council Member Bill Sonor said last week, and if we were in a rural community, this might be an issue, but I, we're, we're in a very high tech area where everybody has access to communications. Um, facilities maintenance and repair, I, I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna reserve my judgment on that till tomorrow, till I meet with Director Bronze. And of course, I've been a, uh, advocating stormwater and fiscal sustainability is still my number one thing. So I, that's, that's the top of my list. We're getting huge amount of money for parks this year. And uh, so I think that's enough already. We don't need to spend any more money there. Uh, transportation improvements at the June 17th meeting, I saw it on the planning calendar. Director Bronze is gonna talk to us about um, the capital project plus his plan for addressing the pavement overlay issues. So I'll reserve some judgment to then. And the city fleet and equipment, I have a maybe because, you know, I mean, things get old. I would not be in favor of necessarily changing all of our vehicles to electric. I think that would be silly. Trying to plow the snow in the winter and you have a power outage with an electric vehicle, what are you gonna do, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. So that's my list. I will submit a list of things I crossed off to, I guess we're gonna all do that, right? Yeah, I, I, what I asked for, I don't think maybe I made myself clear, is for council members right now to provide the three items they'll remove. So, council member Charbonneau, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I can just start with the motion. Um, I move to remove items number seven, electric charging station, number eight, broadband improvements, and number 13, transportation improvements from the ARPA funding plan. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Council Member Charbonneau, seconded by Deputy Mayor Sherlock to remove items, items number seven, electric charging stations, eight, broadband improvements, and 13, transportation improvements from the list of 14 uh, potential ARPA funding areas. So Council Member Charbonneau, would you like to speak to your motion, please? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. And this is just a first preliminary cut. We can, of course, talk about more after this. This is what I'm hearing from folks and what I also feel. Um, thank you, Deputy Mayor Sherlock, for putting yourself out there and taking the leadership step here uh, to go and get into more of the nuance of this. We haven't had a nuanced conversation on a lot of this. Um, for broadband improvements, I believe, uh, Quite simply, I'm on the first phone plan um, I've had as a, an adult, and I have unlimited data for a very cheap cost. Um, if I was going to pursue Wi-Fi, I would go specifically to the Starbucks in the city. Um, I don't think Wi-Fi hotspots in our shopping areas would particularly help us remove the needle in anything there, and I think that's been widely echoed, so I, that's my um, idea there. Electric charging stations, um, it sounds nice in theory, I know other cities have done it. It would only be a couple charging stations. Um, the impact of sort of the environmental impact is not as great for making vehicles electric or having an electric charging station as a lot of other means that we can take would be, um, quite frankly. And I think there are other item actions we can take to sort of encourage business downtown besides the electric charging stations. I think that's one of the weaker ones. And then as far as transportation improvements go, I think it 
it's important to note that the state legislature just passed a absolutely huge transportation package with more money than we've ever seen. And quite frankly, it may sound unprofessional to say this, but based on the layout of our city with a major transportation corridor, if there's any major transportation projects that are going to happen, they just de facto cannot leave us out. There's going to be grants that would come from that. There's going to be means to be included in that. We see, as I mentioned earlier, the exit seven improvements. Um, I know we bear the cost for maintaining Cole Creek, but I, I think this is something that we would absolutely never get left behind on. I think this is something that's lower on Tunnel Pole, and I think it's another thing where our money would not go very far if we put our money into. Um, so that's my, my reasoning there. Okay, thank you. And um, I, I don't see it where a lot of detail is needed right now. We've had talked about this for so many times. Uh, Deputy Mayor Sherlock, go ahead, please. Anything to add? Um, not right now. All right. Motion on the floor to remove items number seven, electric charging stations, eight, broadband improvements, and 13, transportation improvements. Motion made by Council Member Charbonneau, seconded by Deputy Mayor Sherlock. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. I'm sorry, which, who was the, my no? Okay. Um, all right. Motion carries six to one with Council Member Clark dissenting. All right. Anything else? Oh, Deputy Mayor Sherlock, go ahead, please. Sorry, just one thing I wanted to add in the for future discussions. The, the numbers that I put up here add up to 2.3 million. Um, so just in case you're wondering, um, for future reference, that's, that's where I got. I kind of wanted to have a little bit of a buffer in case things cost more than we thought they would. Yeah, we're really not quite to the numbers portion of this project yet. So we're looking for a viable list to take back to our, our town hall and have a very robust conversation, uh, get some questions and address questions of the community. All right, anything else on this? I'd love to trim a couple more. I'll give you a coin if you want to flip for it. <laughs> Council Member Villas, if you are, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, so seven, eight, I, w I mean, agree with, I, I, I agree with. Um, the, uh, I had 10 on my list. Again, that, that uh, you know, SWIM is funded. Uh, we make provisions for it. Um, I would like to have 10 removed in addition. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, I move that we remove item number 10, stormwater infrastructure, from this list. Second. All right, it's been moved by Council Member Villasenor, seconded by Deputy Mayor Sherlock, to remove item number 10, stormwater infrastructure. Council Member Villasenor, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Sherlock, anything to add? No, I think I've spoken enough. Okay. Uh, motion on the floor to remove item number 10, stormwater infrastructure, from our list of considerations for ARPA funding. Uh, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. I need a hand vote real quick. Um, five. five to two? Okay, so five to two and my... Dissenters were Council Member Clark and Council Member Lacosia. All right, motion carries five to two. Okay, um, congratulations. We are now down to ten. Anything else? I make, oh, go ahead, Council sure. Member Clark. Well, let's keep going then. I make a motion to remove uh, park enhancements from the list. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Council Member Clark, seconded by Council Member Lacotia to remove park enhancements from our list of considerations. Council Member Clark, would you like to speak to your motion, please? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I just, we, like I mentioned earlier, we are getting a lot of money for Lake Boren this year, we, and we, are, we budgeted, rather, and we are getting a grant as well. Uh, we are going to do a lot of work with parks this year, and uh, we have money already going to the parks. So I would say that this is something we don't need to spend money on from ARPA right now. All right. All right. Council Member Lakotia, anything to I, add? No, nothing to add. Okay. All right. Um, it's been moved by Council Member Clark, seconded by Council Member Lakotia to remove park enhancements from our list of consideration. Uh, 
All in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed? No. Uh, I have it five to two with count our Deputy Mayor Sherlock and Mayor Newing dissenting. Okay, anything else? I move to remove number two, senior and youth programs from the list. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Council Member Lilcotia, seconded by Council Member Griffin to remove senior youth programs from our list of considerations. Uh, Council Member Lakotia, would you like to speak to your motion? I agree with Council Member, uh, you know, Sherlock, she mentioned that we don't have a space and we have multiple nonprofits, one of which I run, and we do do a lot of uh, programs for seniors. And uh, given that uh, summer is approaching, uh, we're going to get a lot of high school volunteers who will have a lot of free time, and they're already planning a lot of programs for the seniors. So, um, yeah, yeah, putting cities' uh, resources at this point without any plan, I think uh, we can direct it elsewhere. Council Member Griffin, anything to add? Yes, I think it's a very poor time to uh, begin startup programs for uh, uh, this sort of thing. Yep. Um, Council Member Charbonneau, then that was your hand. I'm oh, sorry. Okay, Council Member Charbonneau, go ahead, please. Yeah, Madam Mayor, I was curious. I had a question for you, actually, because you were the one who had brought up senior youth programs the last couple of meetings, I believe correctly. Um, I was curious, you said you were talking with a sort of local community organization about it. Can you expand on that? Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I'm more than happy to. Um, I've been doing some work in the background on this. So a number of years ago, the YMCA offered what was called, I believe, uh, the name may, may be a little off, but Silver Sneakers program uh, that focused on our senior community. And due to funding during the recession of 2008, I believe, they reduced that program. Of, actually, they didn't reduce it. They eliminated it. And... Um, you know, several people just in, in my interaction in the community uh, as I was a commissioner and also on council, they, they brought this up. Um, we have a privately owned facility in the community who, you know, we've been talking with um, and they're very interested in potentially getting some type of grant or funding, you know, through this plan to build a, a senior program that will attract, they can, they'll be able to market it, they'll be able to, to design the program with this grant and then build the program to a point where it is sustainable, whereas those who are participating are now covering the cost of this program. It would be a one-time grant uh, that I'm envisioning with this program. And, you know, our, we have a, a wide variety of age groups in this community. Um, I think it's something council could consider. I'd love to take it to the community and get their input on it. Does Mayor, Mayor, that answer can, your question? Oh, can I ask you a question about of that? Of course. Um, did, did this, did they have a location for the plan that they brought to you? Like, where were they thinking of? Their studio. They, they own a business in, in Newcastle. Oh. Yeah. Uh, they live and own in Newcastle. Okay. Yeah. Is it a large studio? Is it, what it, could it house adequately? The... Yeah. I mean, they do programs there now, like, you know, yoga and, um, you know, group personal training sessions. Where um, is this at? Uh, I've actually been speaking with uh, Christina or Aurelia at the Verde Studio. Thank you. And she's very interested in such in implementing such a program. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Council Member Sharpenow. If we were to not fund something like that through ARPA funding, what would be the other alternative source that it could potentially come from? There may be some other uh, recovery money that could offer grants for that purpose, uh, um, but I'm unclear about that. I. I don't see or hear of anything else on the horizon that they could tap into other than local ARPA funds. Deputy Mayor Sherlock, I'm sorry, I forgot about you. Okay. Um, while I love everyone's enthusiasm with my, my list that I made, I do hesitate a little bit. I didn't mean to um, take everything that I had crossed off 
off today because I do feel it's important to have a good, robust conversation with our community at the town hall. So this one I would, personally, I'm gonna hold off on and not support this motion just for that reason. Just I wanna have more conversation with the community. Okay, motion on the floor to remove item number two, senior youth programs made by council member Clark, seconded by council member Lakotia. Uh, I apologize. Okay, council member Lakotia is seconded by council member Griffin. I didn't happen to write that one down and there we have it. Um, so uh, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Uh, motion fails four to three with council member Five to three, five to two. Okay, council members Lakotia and Griffin uh, dissenting. It's, pardon me? Oh, in favor. <laughs> Who must be getting late. <laughs> okay, we are down to, we are down, we have whittled our list. Um, any additional motions? Yes, Madam Mayor, I make a motion that we remove outdoor gathering areas. Second. All right, it's been moved by Council Member Clark, seconded by Council Member Lakotia to remove outdoor gathering areas. Council Member Clark, would you like to speak to your motion, please? Uh, yes, we, we have, like I mentioned earlier, we have plenty of uh, great parks. We have people gather at uh, Starbucks and restaurants outdoors. There's, um, you know, people out walking all the time. My neighbors, they gather together to go for walks. There's plenty of, you know, outdoor gathering areas. Could we have more? Certainly, and but I believe it. You know, if we're trying to narrow this down, right? Let's be realistic. This is not a bad idea, but I think we need to focus our money on the other more important things on this list. Councilmember Lakotia, anything to add? No. Okay. Um, if Councilmember Charbonneau, then Deputy Mayor Sherlock. Yeah, I will add. I talked um, at length with this about. Um, I guess no longer City Manager Wyman. There are opportunities looking at outdoor gathering areas, um, and it's not just Lake Bourne, there's actually another site, sort of, if you go past like the Red Bridge and then turn right in the land that's still Newcastle for sports fields, um, that could generate revenue. Um, for both of those, there is, that is something that is open to a lot more grants, so I would say that this is not the only means to address those things. I think there was talk with partnering with, potentially with something like an amphitheater talk, partnering with a children's theater um, group, I think there are means to address that through potentially the county and different grants, whereas some of these other things I feel like are not as much. So that's where I'm sort of, I guess, noodling on it is I do think there are means. And I would enjoy hearing other um, questions or comments. Oh, sorry, Deputy Mayor Sherlock, go ahead, please. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to just reiterate my last point that I feel strongly that this should stay on the list for when we talk to the community. Uh, Mayor Knight, can I add one more thing, please? The, <clears throat> there, you know, now that Energize Eastside has gone through, right? We we know that Puget Sound Energy is going to come to the city and need places to stage, and this has been discussed, or from my understanding, as a potential spot. And of course, you know, in return, we can say to them, fix this up and make a nice park out of it for us. So, uh, speaking to other opportunities, you know, uh, should that come to pass, that is a very potential a very good potential for us to get this area taken care of through other means. So, like I said, I think we have sufficient outdoor areas at this point. Okay, I can, oh, I'm sorry. De Council Member Villasenor? Oh, Council Member Griffin, okay, go ahead. Um, what do you mean by uh, outdoor gathering places? Don't we have some like at uh, Lake Boron and that uh, uh, people gather at, uh, various of the parks are we talking about building uh, other park areas and uh, or other facilities in the park no, this is not anything new to add this is more geared toward enhancements to our outdoor facilities our outdoor areas our gathering spaces uh, um, you know potentially adding amenities to those spaces improving you know, like, like play equipment. Um, Deputy Mayor Sherlock, you wanted to chime in on that as well. Yeah, thanks. I, um, 
so when I was doing this, what I was specifically thinking about is the stage at Lake Bird Park. We currently, the city uses it for, was going to be using it for concerts, but um, it's in such, it's not in good shape. And so we actually can't rent it out to people because of liability issues. So I, my thought on this, and again, this is just my thought, and this is why I want to keep it on there to continue talking about it, is if that were fixed up, um, it would be a better place for us to gather, but also there's potential for the city to, to rent it out, um, and so there's revenue potential there. But also, I feel really strongly that this is one of the things that we, um, we lost during COVID, and this money is meant to um, help with with that time and I having a large space for our community to gather to me is just so essential to what the the spirit of this money should be used for so that's why I'm just advocating to keep it on the list for now and continue the conversation well I think that uh, some of the uh, people who live in the apartment houses they take their kids to the park to, to uh, play, and so if we build things in the park that are going to interfere with that, those people were definitely opposed to it in the last town hall meeting. So I think we ought to keep that in consideration. Okay, I can no longer stay silent on these topics. Um, park enhancements were just eliminated. Um, you know, now outdoor gathering areas. These items are the highest ranked areas of importance on every community survey we've done. And now we don't want to improve them. This is low hanging fruit, you guys. You know, as a member of the Community Activities Commission, I helped you do all the outreach for the Lake Board Master Plan. I am so committed to that plan and to not throw it on a shelf and let it collect dust. And I feel that's what we're doing here. We have a grant, we have a half a million dollar grant. This is just a huge opportunity to do something fabulous with our Crown Jewel Park, our largest park, where we hold every summer event in town other than National Night Out. You know, there are sports courts over there that can be improved. There are, you know, picnic amenities and shelters that can be improved. There's very old playground equipment. Come on. We have a, a commission, seven volunteers, that parks fall under part of their charter. You know, years ago, that group went out. They looked at the play equipment. They looked at the picnic uh, tables. They reported back to our public works department and said, hey, we were out at this park and this picnic table is broken. This bench is not stable. And it was a report that he could present to his maintenance team and say, can you guys check this out? Saving them time and energy so they didn't have to go out and look at every facility and every you know nut and bolt and making sure that our equipment is safe for our children. Um, we're outdoor people. We live in the Northwest, and this is what living in the Northwest is all about, our outdoor amenities. I grew up here. I've never lived anywhere else. Uh, this, this is the Northwest, folks, and I really believe council should support our outdoor amenities um, and maybe you know, go back and lump together park enhancements and outdoor gathering areas. Oh, I just turn off my mic. Any further comments, questions? All right, it's been moved by Council Member Clark, seconded by Council Member Lakotia to remove outdoor gathering areas from our list of uh, possible funding options. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Council Member Charbonneau, you voted. You voted no. Okay. 
uh, motion fails three to four with council members Griffin, Lakotia and Clark uh, voting in favor of the motion. Okay, we have done, yes, sir. I would just like to clarify that these are just the items that we're bringing to the town hall. We're, we haven't removed anything essentially from any further discussion about any of these items. And so while I feel like we're getting slightly heated about this, I'm of the mind that these are the things we're gonna present at the town hall. My sense is there are gonna be people at the town hall who will have interest in all 14 of these things. We will present these. My sense is during any sort of Q&A, we might see some of these other things bubble up. And so I don't feel like anything we're doing here is Permanent. We're just setting an agenda for the things we will definitely talk about, knowing, and in you know, in my opinion, knowing that the rest of these will likely come up. <laughs> so, so that's that's how I'm going about this vote. Uh, these are the things I think we should bring. I'd like to hear feedback on these things specifically. I'm expecting to hear feedback from, on all of these things. And we will take this list and show them what we removed and what remains. So thank you for that. Okay, um, we have removed about half of the list. I'm happy with that. Uh, any other comments? Uh, Council Member Clark, go ahead. Do you still ahead. want us to submit a list of three remaining items to take off? What is the thought now? I think, that, I think that's okay, yeah. Yeah, we can, we can, we can submit a, a list if you have additional things that um, uh, we're actually meeting next week on the town hall, so um, not not council, mm -hmm. but uh, Deputy Mayor Sherlock and I are meeting with staff to finalize everything next week. Okay, um, thank you, everyone. All right, I'm going to move on on our agenda. Adoption of Ordinance 2022-643, Comprehensive Plan Amendment Schedule. Senior Planner Vandaway. Vandaway. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, oh, it's actually the other one without the sandwiches. So this is a proposed uh, code amendment regarding the comprehensive plan amendment schedule. Um, staff found some conflicts between the language in the comp plan itself and the municipal code. And so this ordinance aims to fix that uh, difference. Um, so the comprehensive plan is the city's long range planning document that provides our vision, our goals uh, and, and objectives for a long range period. Um, we consider periodic updates, which are uh, required by state law. Uh, it used to be once every eight years. Uh, the governor just signed a new bill that uh, changed that schedule to once every 10 years. So we're going to undergo a, a, a periodic update in 2024 is our next one. Um, and that's when the city engages with the public to reassess our vision and our goals and the big picture topics for uh, areas such as housing and economic development and transportation and so on. Um, but between those periodic updates, uh, the, the city uh, can make minor updates once per year and state law limits us to updating the plan once per year. Um, and with those annual updates, either uh, council members or the planning commissioners or city staff can propose amendments to the plan uh, minor changes here and there, not changing major goals or policies, but it's usually to update various maps and, and to make clarifications here and there. Uh, and members of the public can also propose uh, amendments during those annual updates. And when the public uh, proposes an update, it's usually to rezone property that they own. Uh, that's virtually always what, what the public proposes. Um, and so if we, uh, go to the next slide, Jeff, thanks. Uh, in the comp plan, uh, it, pro uh, it provides the, the amendment schedule you see here where it, it 
requires the city to issue a public notice by June 1st saying that members of the public, if you're going to submit a, 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 a proposed amendment for the annual update, you have to submit it by July 15th. Um, and then the Planning Commission recommends a docket or a set of amendments to City Council. City Council approves that docket in the fall. Uh, then the following January or February, uh, the Planning Commission offers their recommendations on each amendment on that docket to Council. And then finally, around the spring, Council takes action to approve or not approve each proposed amendment on the docket. So that's what's in the comp plan right now, but that does not match what's in our city code. Um, um, so if, if you want to visualize that schedule I just showed you, uh, July 15th is the public deadline, and then around April 30th of the following calendar year is, is when that schedule anticipates the city wrapping up one amendment cycle for the comp plan. Uh, however, in Newcastle Municipal Code, um, it's a little bit peculiar in that it says that uh, the public has until February 1st to submit uh, a proposed amendment. Elsewhere in the code, it says they have until July 15th. So obviously the two dates don't match. And it also specifies that, um, uh, that amendments be acted upon within the same calendar year. Uh, and so that doesn't give the city a great deal of time to consider amendments. Uh, the Planning Commission expressed some frustration last year when they wanted to propose some amendments, but we really didn't have enough time as staff to research and evaluate uh, some of their ideas. And so this proposed code amendment is going to set July 15th as the deadline for submitting proposed amendments, and we're not going to set a deadline for final action. Uh, final action will be taken the following year per state law, because we're limited to one amendment per year, the city will have until December 31st of the following calendar year to adopt amendments. Um, and so this is what the schedule would look like if you adopt this ordinance. Um, uh, the public will have until July 15th to propose amendments, um, and then we'll, we'll go through the usual process of creating a docket and, and taking action on each of those items, and, and we'll have to complete that by the end of 2023. Um, and this raises the question of, well, what do we do with amendments proposed, already proposed for 2022? And fortunately, this year, we don't have any proposed by the public. No rezoning applications, um, none under consideration. So we'll essentially forego this year's amendment cycle and any amendments proposed by July 15th of this year, the city can wait until the end of 2023 to take action on them. That'll give us plenty of time to do all the research and, and uh, all due consideration to any proposed amendment. Uh, and so the Planning Commission held a public hearing on this ordinance uh, last month, um, and they recommended approval of it. We did not hear any opposition from the public. Um, so this is the recommended motion to approve the ordinance as presented. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. If I could just add one more thing to that. I think it's important to mentioning is that, and if you could just go back to your calendar there, Dave, um, what this will uh, look like is that we've got more time for a single cycle, but it'll also involve some overlapping of cycles. And so, for example, you'll notice in, in 2022 in this illustration, the 2023 cycle begins on July 15th of 2022, but we may already have something from the previous year in process. It will be finished up December 31st of 2022. So as long as we're not approving more than once per year, doesn't mean we can't begin the process for the next year by, by soliciting you know, people to put in their applications for the following year. So there's that kind of overlap, but it still works. But it just gives us the more time. And you've got clear till December 31st to, to approve it. And, and if you don't, it doesn't mean you can't approve it next year, but that by default becomes that next year's cycle. So you, you wouldn't be able to do any other changes for that particular year. Council Member Sharpen, go ahead, please. Thank you, uh, Planner Vandeway. I was curious, has there ever been a, this might not be a fair question for you because I guess this is more institutional history, has there ever been a time where we've had a more frequent amendment cycle than um, annually? Uh, no, per state law, we cannot update more frequently than once per year. 
And I was curious, to, so you talked about the idea of uh, adopting this ordinance would forgo the cycle and sort of give us towards the end of 2023, if I'm um, understanding that correctly. I just, I worry about sort of potential inertia and I think local engagement with government if we have um, sort of, if it's being pushed back to that degree, uh, I think that could be a means of disenfranchisement for individuals and I'd like to hear you sort of speak to that. Sure, so the the city doesn't, if, if you adopt this ordinance, you don't necessarily have to wait, um, what would it be, 16 months before you take action on, on a proposed amendment. You can certainly take action sooner than that, and I imagine in most years you will, but should other items, you know, occupy your agendas and you have to put off an amendment, you'd have until the end of the following year. Any other questions? Councilmember Clark, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so it, maybe it's not clear just to me, but if let's say on somebody submits an amendment or request and on by July 15th and we decided to act on it in October, right, for that, so every individual um, uh, request is treated separately. We're not gathering them all together and making one one motion on all the amendments for that year. Is that is that right? So, well, so it's really a two-part process. First, city council approves a docket. They mm -hmm. go through all the proposed amendments and decide which ones meet the criteria in our code. Mm -hmm. And then later in the year or later in the cycle, they take action on each proposed amendment within that docket. So they're all they're, there's a separate action on each proposed amendment by council. Deputy Mayor Sherlock, go ahead, please. Um, thank you for all this. Um, is there, in this ordinance, is it, does it stipulate when, when the, the public is notified or how often the public is notified that they can submit? Right, so we'll keep that June 1st deadline for the city to notify the public, and that goes into the newspaper and our website. So, yeah, the public will still be notified they have the opportunity to, to propose an amendment. And that just happens once a year? It does. And is that is that also mandated that that only happens once a year? Well, no. the, the state requires that each jurisdiction set a schedule for, for their individual comp plan, and so that's the deadline that, that we've been using in the past. Okay. Um, just thinking about what Councilmember Charbonneau brought up, like if there was more opportunities throughout the year for people to at least know that they can submit something, you know, and then it's all, so then it's all kind of collected and then we, um, we can only approve the docket. We have one chance at a docket, right? Is that once a year? And, but right. then each individual thing on the docket can be yes or no. Right, per state law, all the amendments have to be considered together in one docket so that uh, the, the city can evaluate the, the total impact of all of them together. Okay, Was there is there any thoughts on noticing more than once a year? There we go. I, I think it's helpful to, you know, remember that, that we, we talk with people all the time in, in pre-apps and whatnot. They want to do things with their property. And we'll talk about whether something needs a comp plan amendment. So through those normal, regular conversations we have, we often talk about, well, you know, there's the upcoming comp plan amendment cycle. So most people that are applying have already kind of been engaging with us, you know, talking about what they may want to do with their property. I won't guarantee that's always the case, but, but you know, that, that's, that's often the case. So I think I think this is actually the first year I've been on council that we haven't had any individuals approach in addition to the docket, really. You know? That so makes this a good year to do this, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but I, I've definitely seen many situations where we've been approached for additions to the docket and we've put them on there. So. All right. Anything else for. Mr. Vandeway. Okay, any motions out there? Sorry. 
Um, I will move to adopt the comprehensive plan amendment schedule ordinance as presented in Exhibit 1. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Council Member Villa Senor, seconded by Council Member Griffin to adopt Ordinance 2022-643 as presented in, in Exhibit 1. Council Member Villa Senor, do you want to speak to your motion? Um, I, th I just think it's good housekeeping, so I support this motion. Thank All you. right, Council Member Griffin, anything to add? I think it's the right idea. Okay, motion on the floor to adopt Ordinance 2022-643 as presented in an Exhibit 1. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it, 7-0. Thank you, folks. Moving on to, I believe we have Ms. Fitzgibbons back and Director Eisgathorpe for adoption of Ordinance 2022-644, mobile food vending. Um, I want to, and the attorney chambers help me out here if I stumble. Um, I just want to give council one little piece of information here that uh, if we pass this ordinance tonight, great. Then you know, our, our work on this is complete. If we, um, if somebody offers an amendment, we will have to bring it back at our next meeting. Remember this ordinance does expire at the end of June. Um, or we can pass it and then ask staff to bring back an amended ordinance but it does require a public hearing. So there's some timing involved because it has to go to Department of Commerce and hopefully we can get it back before our next meeting, which is June 21. Attorney Chambers, anything to add to that, please? Uh, no, uh, Development Director Oscar Thorpe, anything to add? Just procedurally? No, I, I think we're, we're just, our, our plan is to present, to listen to your feedback, and if there's something that would require amendment, I think your, your point's well taken that any amendments would put in motion a, a required new process. So there's a timing issue there. Um, you just need to be aware of that. Yeah. But, but, but to your main point as well is that if, if we fail to adopt this, our existing ordinance goes away, and we're back to where we don't allow any food trucks. So just so that we're clear on what the implications of different motions may, okay. may fail. Yeah, and I just kind of wanted them to have an idea going into it so they can be aware, and then we'll address any remaining issues at the end. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, so, I'm sorry to make people hungry. Um, the Tonight, I just want to go over the, a little bit of the history of the ordinance um, for new council members, and then the general findings from the multiple discussions we've had with the Planning Commission and City Council last year. Um, and then we'll go over the, the proposed changes, which are actually fairly minor, and you probably saw in your packet already. Um, the uh, ordinance was inspired by events in summer of 2020, when the city was using food trucks for events that could be socially distanced at Lake Ford Park, um, obviously due to the pandemic. The city recognized the need to have food trucks to uh, obtain business licenses and Department of Health permits, and so um, this ordinance kicked off. In early 2021, staff brought the item to uh, the Planning Commission with the hopes of being able to apply the new ordinance to any um, events held that summer. And uh, it was passed uh, by city council that summer. And, um, but it was also adopted as mentioned already with the sunset date, which is June 30th of 2022. We have been back through the process with the planning commission and we're just bringing back what is intended to be the permanent ordinance. Um, over the past year, staff have really only heard from one to two residents asking about food trucks. In the current interim item, uh, ordinance, a vendor may only visit a property three times per calendar year. They must have a city permit with proof of business license and Department of Health permit, and this is applied in any zone. The process was found to be too arduous by those few residents who inquired on the process. Um, and so no one actually pulled a permit. Um, 
<clears throat> planning commission, uh, when we discussed this with planning commission, uh, they did consider some different options. One, just to let the code expire. Two, to make minor modifications based on the feedback from the public. Uh, three, to allow maybe a few mobile food vendors permanently in the downtown commercial area. Uh, we talked about a lottery system, a first come first serve basis, um, and then uh, looked for other uh, ways that maybe we could have just a few in the downtown area. Um, and then four, some combination of the above. Planning Commission recognized the variety that food trucks bring. However, that businesses also who invest in brick and mortar storefronts are really contributing greatly to the city's economic development and the city as a whole. In addition, the downtown strategic plan really emphasizes the built environment with the occasional use of food trucks. Considering the downtown's vision, um, the impact of the pandemic on brick and mortar stores and uh, it has just been generally been thought that it would be best to allow mobile food on a very limited basis citywide. Um, and that's why we've kept the three times per calendar year per property. Um, and that's for a maximum of 12 hours per event, uh, with the exception of city events, uh, which have a lot more flexibility. Um, I'm just going to go briefly through the proposed changes. Uh, the first one is changing the sunset date to a permanent ordinance. Secondly, uh, re remove the requirement for permits in the residential areas. Residential zones would still be limited to three events per year per property, but they wouldn't be required to have a permit per se. So this is similar to when you build a fence, you can have a six foot fence and you don't have to pull a permit for that. Um, events counting against a full subdivision, the events on a private property used to count in the current ordinance counts as a, against the entire subdivision. Considering that we only heard from a handful of people last year, we separated that. It's a lot less arduous for staff to track um, and gives a lot more um, for, um, flexibility in the neighborhoods. <clears throat> Um, we proposed a definition of institutional uses and also allowed institutions uh, to have multiple trucks at their events in this proposed code. So that would be, for example, a school event or a church event could have multiple food trucks at their events that they sometimes do. Um, and lastly, um, the current code says bricks, businesses with brick and mortar stores within the city limits who have mobile food carts may operate those carts at an unlimited frequency. The purpose of this was to allow a vendor such as Frosty Barrel, who has a food cart, to be able to operate it on, at an unlimited basis. However, Planning Commission pointed out that this is potentially opens up a loophole because then you could have any retail business have any food cart in the city, so you could have um, the Galaxy Cats have a food cart and they, they could operate their food cart anywhere. Anyway, it just opened up sort of a loophole, so it was recommended just to take this out completely. We did have a public hearing on April 27th. Um, the only comment came from Mr. Tom Ramsey, who owns uh, the Tuscan Stone Pizza Restaurants. Mr. Ramsey stated that he really feels like a part of the community and he would like to say, the commission was sympathetic. However, when it came down to considering the downtown as a whole, it was determined that there really is not a way to allow just one business to stay. Um, the reason is that Tuscan Stone Pizza was established after the city was incorporated and the city had already adopted this property use table that you see, which allows eating and drinking places under um, the line with 58 on it. We added mobile food vending last year, and in fact, it would be removed again if this, um, if this ordinance expires. But eating and drinking places does not include mobile food vending. Therefore, we wouldn't be able to allow any mobile food vendors again. Um, and Tuscan Stone Pizza, therefore, falls into this. Um, they're not a legal, non-conforming business because they were established after the use table was established. Um, so in order to retain Tuscan Stone downtown, we need to somehow make them legal. 
while also applying any provisions that we applied to their business to the entire zone or downtown area. The code would have to be amended to allow businesses to stay permanently because Tustin's Cold Stone Pizza does not actually leave their site. They don't go back to a commissary at night. They just stay. Um, the city would then have to amend the code to remove the 12 hour limitation on the mobile food vending and the three day time limit that we currently have. Um, this could open the downtown to many more permanent mobile food vendors, which is not the intent of the downtown strategic plan and has a pot potential to undermine efforts put forth by our brick and mortar businesses and the developers of those centers. So uh, staff has brought the recommendation um, from the Planning Commission, um, which is uh, to this code that you um, were presented in the, in the packet. And with that, uh, that completes staff's report. And I'll just add to that, um, you know, there was a lot of sympathy toward um, uh, Mr. Ramsey. Um, I mean, I've had Tuscan Stone Pizza, it's one of my favorites. and. You know, uh, he has, as he stated, become just kind of that part of the community that people just expect to see it there. Um, and um, we we just look at this inside out, upside down, sideways, every which way to see what we might do. We explored ways of is there a way to adopt a, a, a quick adoption of code to, to get you know anyone the chance to get their foot in the door, and that opened up the process issue that that you know uh, Mayor Newing mentioned. And the, the thing that makes this difficult is, is, is two things. And I, I want to stress that, that the proposed ordinance doesn't ban food trucks in downtown. It just puts them on par with food truck allowances everywhere in the city, three times per year, 12 hours per day. So even if we were to, for example, open this up to allow more food trucks in, in the downtown on a, on a more regular basis, we still have the problem that, you know, this is about mobile food vending. Well. Tuscan Stone, the, the, the facility has wheels, but it doesn't move, you know. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it doesn't facilitate his model unless we were to, as, as, as Planner Fitzgibbon mentioned, take away the 12 hour time limit. That makes these permanent businesses that somebody can come in, wheel in their, their truck or their, or their shipping container, put it on a site, and completely bypass, circumvent our downtown plan, the design standards, the setback standards all the things that we worked on so hard to create this sense of place, architectural, you know, aesthetics. Um, and, and so we, we just haven't known what to do with this. It's been very, very difficult. Usually when we've got a, diff a difficult issue, there's, there's a solution. You know, we, we may not necessarily think it's the best solution, but there are solutions. This one has just, personally, I feel stumped by it. Um, I, 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 you know, you know it's, it's just a very difficult thing. So. We're anxious to get your feedback. Uh, the ordinance before you is per the Planning Commission's recommendation. Um, and, and the staff agrees with it, by the way. So. Council Member Sharpenow, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, so Planner Fitzgibbons, it says early on in the document that it talked about this idea of not collecting property tax, which I understand there's probably no workaround, but also not collecting sales tax from mobile food vendors. Is there any means to collect sales tax from mobile food vendors, or does that just not happen or occur? Um, it would be um, the sales tax from the, and Don can probably answer, or director Don. We do have sales tax from Tuscan, um, so we do collect that. Through the business license, correct. And just to one more thing to that, I, I think some of the, the, the questions of that have been as, as mobile food trucks have kind of meandered in and come and gone unaware of, of things just because kind of word got out that we're allowing food trucks or they thought that we were, there were things occurring that we, we weren't approving, we didn't have business licenses for and, and, and so th there was a loss there because again, word got out that the city was allowing food trucks and they just started to happen. So the good thing about Tuscan Stone is that they've been here long enough that they were aware they needed a business license. Others don't necessarily know that and don't comply with that. Gotcha. So I guess my other thing then is I would like to I probably have a contrary view on this to a lot of folks. Um, I really appreciate the easing of residential zoning use. Um, I think that's uh, great. I think a lot of the other provisions are great. I would like to even go a little further and be 
promote more food trucks downtown. Um, and the reason I say that is because I think we've talked about this idea of economic development a lot and working to get more people to stop here through having a transportation corridor. I think that's something that more food trucks could potentially do. It feels very uh, demeaning to speak down about two food trucks versus brick and mortar businesses when it might be a business that doesn't have the financial capital to invest in a brick and mortar business, especially in Newcastle, where it's very expensive. Um, I think we might have overregulated this a little bit. To me, it feels very, um, you know, a lot of the reasoning that we get into sort of towards the end here, it feels very not in my backyard from a capacity of sort of food vending, right? It's like the, you know, you talk about the character, you talk about, um, use and all these other things. Well, to me, if we're collecting sales tax on it and we're just getting more people to stop and we're offering more food options, I think those are all boons to our city. And I think we have to be, we have to acknowledge that we're going to have an implicit bias of the businesses that we've had here for so long that we know um, they're going to want to lobby us to not do this because they don't want to have any form of competition. But it's, you know, I think we shouldn't deter folks from being a part of our community and being a part of our city because they started later, right? Like Mr. Ramsey did, because they didn't have that financial capital. So to me, I would like to, I don't know if it would be an amendment or what exactly would be occur, but I would like to encourage more food trucks downtown. I think it's, to me, this seems like a sort of a thing is we don't want to have to figure out how to legislate it. I would rather encourage it and then figure out how to legislate it based on the demand, because I think the demand would be there versus just um, sort of outright say we can't have these things downtown. and. I'd love to hear a continued sort of discussion on that. Any other comments? Council Member Villaston, you are. Go ahead, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, as a member of the Planning Commission who worked on this last year, um, we had similar concerns about restrictions and those kinds of things. And 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 I like and we and we set it up with an expiration so that we could learn for a year. And the learning shows in this in this ordinance. I think we've seen there's a lot of improvement. There's a lot of we've experienced things. Okay, here's the improvement. And so I, I like the I like what's come before us. But I'm going to disagree with uh, Councilmember Charbonneau in that the businesses who invest in brick and mortar they pay leases. They pay tens of thousands of dollars in tenant improvements. There's a significant investment in our community, whereas Food, mobile food vendors seem transitory. They're not, if they come here and they're not successful, they leave. <laughs> they roll, the, they roll, the, they roll the, the cart away. The people who invest in commercial property and make that investment in our community are more, you know, are more incentivized to make sure that that business serves the community in a way that, that that the, they'll do business with the community. So having the, ARPA, <laughs> having the ARPA discussion earlier this evening and then coming here and saying, well, maybe mobile food vending would be just fine. Maybe Hanson Brothers wants to put a taco truck in the roadway 200 feet from Tapatio just seems, just seems wrong. We're trying to help the local businesses, and yet we would open the door for transitory businesses to take away from our brick and mortar. It doesn't make sense to me. So. I like the way this is written. Um, I agreed with the steps we took last year from the Planning Commission standpoint. I really uh, like the, the improvements that we've made and incorporating the learning that we've had over the past year. And so I would really like to support this, uh, this ordinance. I appreciate you reminding us that you worked on the other side of this coin um, as well. So that perspective is, uh, you know, Good reminder. Thank you. Anyone else? Council Member Charbonneau, you again. <laughs> Sorry, I, I apologize. Um, you know, so I actually, I actually was a food truck employee. Uh, my senior year of college, I was tired of student government. Um, I worked on the traffic truck in Southern California, and um, actually, that was something I brought to my college as well. Was I brought food trucks, and it was a rotating sort of menu that I think a lot of students appreciated. Um, I disagree with the transitory nature because I think you have they're going to have less of, you know, financial capital, a lot of these people to put down brick and mortar, but you're going to have, you have an incentive to do well in the area because I mean, the two food truck bosses I had were two of the hardest working people I've ever seen because they work 365 days a year. They, they're trying to support their businesses and to 
I, it feels very much like talking down to these businesses to just say, just because you didn't have brick and mortar, you can't be here. And I think it could add a lot to room security and we're something that I would want to explore and add more to. And I feel like we don't know what we're not, what we don't know here. And I think it's, to me, it's, um, you know, I, th I think it could be something that people really appreciate. I think we have a lot of young families that have moved in that I think would enjoy exploring that and exploring the option. And I think it was noted that public comment was limited. It, all the things I've mentioned are limited. And I would love to see that. And I think we are well within our means to be able to do the work to figure out how to um, deal with any consequences that might come. Councilman for Villa Senor, I feel like I've got dueling badges so, here. <laughs> I just want to make I just want to make it very clear that I am by no means um, degrading the work that small businesses do. My family owned a family-owned restaurant in a very small town, and I washed dishes and bus tables for no money <laughs> for three dollars a week, literally as a young person because it was the family and we put and we put a ton of work into it to make it successful so I get that I, I really do but um, but as a community the size of Newcastle it's not like we're Bellevue where Bellevue has all this commercial and all these pockets that aren't served by by restaurants and other things so food trucks might make a lot of sense in those communities but Newcastle small and so when you insert a food truck into our downtown area or near our downtown area it has a very direct effect on the businesses that are operating there so it's apples and oranges as far as our community versus Renton or Bellevue or Issaquah I think that I think that they might be able to to find proper spaces for for those kinds of businesses but I think Newcastle is a different different uh, different case and and I think this ordinance is reflective of that Okay, any additional comments, motions? Deputy Mayor Sherlock, go ahead, please. Thank you. I'm, this was a hard one for me. I'm very, I'm in between um, Council Member Charbonneau and Council Member Villasenor. I'm also just really sad that, I just wanna say publicly, I'm very sad that we couldn't find a way for Tuscan Stone, although I do appreciate and wanna recognize that staff has spent a lot of time trying to figure out that problem, and unfortunately, it, it, unfortunately, I, it doesn't seem like we can find a solution um, for them. Although I do hope that they can find a place close by, another location close by, because I do I enjoy going to them as well. Um, I don't know. I feel like. <sighs> It, this is a somewhat of a compromise. It's not banning outright. It, it feels a little on the restrictive side still for me, um, but I'm not one to, if there's a consensus in, on council, I, I, I don't like to push too hard um, if I'm on the fence. So I don't know, it's a hard one for me. chime in, I guess. Um, you know, this this was a hard project a year ago. It doesn't get any easier. So I guess we could chalk it up to being a very difficult issue to deal with. Um, my fear of food trucks and allowing them in our city is it could escalate to something we don't want to see happen. And I think you know, maybe pulling the reins a little bit tighter and approving this ordinance tonight um, is, it, it's worked for a year. We haven't had any complaints. Uh, I, I understand Mr. Ramsey's point of view. It's a business, it's his business. Like council member Villa Senor, I grew up with you know, a dad who was a sole proprietor. And um, it, it, it's just a tough one, but I think to preserve what we want to accomplish here in Newcastle, and Director Arsgathor made it very clear how hard, he reminded us how hard we worked on that downtown strategic plan 
It was a long one. And I was very involved with a lot of community outreach. Um, and we believe we designed a downtown that we can look forward to building someday. And, um, you know, I, I, I think it's working and it's, it's not broken, but I don't want it to get to the point of broken where we're sitting here one night trying to clean it up. Clean it up. Um, so that's kind of where I am on it. Council Member Griffin, go ahead, please. I move to adopt Ordinance 2022-644, Mobile Food Vending, as presented. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. A move by Council Member Griffin, seconded by Council Member Villasenor, to adopt Ordinance 2022-644, as presented in Exhibit 1. Council Member Griffin, would you like to speak yes, to Yes, I think we asked the staff to put together an ordinance. They spent a lot of time on it. There's a lot of thought involved, and I think they did a, an excellent job in getting us an ordinance that uh, we should approve. Council Member Villasenor, anything to add? Thank you. Uh, Council Member Charbonneau, comment? I move to amend the motion to remove the 12 hour time limit for mobile food vendors and three day time limit for mobile food vendors. Amendment right. fails due to lack of a second. Um, returning to the main motion, which is to adopt Ordinance 2022-644 as presented in Exhibit 1. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, ayes have it six to one with Council Member Charbonneau dissenting. Okay, moving on. Hold on here. Um, additional public comment so we have a public comment from the audience go ahead please state your name and neighborhood in which you reside and you'll have three minutes to speak jeff knowing by the little roadie farm I want to congratulate the council. It's 922, and it appears that you're going to have a short evening tonight. So good use of your time. That's um, appreciated from lonely audience members. Council Member Clark, your empty chamber comment. Didn't you see me, the only lonely resident of New Council, sitting over there? I'm here because I care about New Council. Just to remind you, my roots go back to 1965 unincorporated Newcastle, this area, before it became a city, to be viewed as an invi invisible resident sitting in the chamber really hurts. I hope that's not a reflection on how you view certain residents in Newcastle. My other comment is, and I wasn't going to say this, way back when you made a comment about body language I'd like you to go back and look at the video about your body language right now, okay? The speed hump proposal that you made. I was really surprised that you made that comment because everything that you've talked about, you need to know cost, what it's going to cost the city. And I'm not sure what your motive was to get that passed through that quickly without an analysis because other come. Council members that view your position want to know right down to the penny what something's going to cost before it goes forward. So I'm not sure what the motive was behind that one. So in the future, you know, I think that you need to stick to your guns and if you want something passed, you need to come up with what the proposal is and what the cost is going to be. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Anything in the virtual room? Yes, we do have one uh, public comment been switched to the panelist and um, excuse me uh, mr. merchant you can go ahead and make your comment now if you unmute yourself can you hear me y yes okay thank you very much for the time I appreciate all the hard work the city council does and I am uh, my family owns the uh, gas station across the street Arco where Tom Ramsey's food truck is there 
you know, it's not a regular food truck. It's not like you would judge it the same way as transient food trucks. And I hope that the council takes that into consideration. Uh, the second thing is that, you know, these landlords are the reason why some of these tenants can't pay their rent in restaurants because they keep escalating the cost. So giving up on the people who are providing a low cost product to the citizens of Newcastle, they're actually playing into the hand of corporate America where these people are actually taking money away from the poor people and the middle class people who are operating a decent business here. They run a top class product here. And I think that instead of banning it, we should try to legislate it by raising the bar and actually putting in some guidelines so that it's not open to every uh, food truck that doesn't meet the high bar of Newcastle. Newcastle is a classy city. It's a great city. It's inclusive. Let's make this inclusive where we raise the bar and allow certain food trucks that meet that bar. And finally, as an owner of that property, I have obviously an interest, but I would say this much, that I would I will donate 20% of the rent that comes from Mr. Ramsey to any program that the city wants to fund. So that's my offer to the city as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Merchant. That's it, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Director Bronze. Okay, moving on, planning calendar. I believe that was placed on the dais and emailed out earlier. Um, I'll turn it over to City Manager Larson. Thank you, Mayor. I am not familiar with how this should work, so <laughs> I'm not going to try to fit it here. That's okay. <laughs> Throwing you to the wolves. <laughs> I certainly will take a pinch hit from any of the staff here who can help out, but uh, I'm not sure what the procedure should be here. But I do want to note that. Um, the town hall meeting has been, as I mentioned already, but that's uh, scheduled for June 7th. That would be a regular council meeting night, and it's, uh, I believe May is, a, I want to call it a fifth fifth Tuesday night, so there will not be another council meeting for another three weeks, so we got a, a, a nice break in between here. But of course, we'll be closed for uh, Memorial Day, and then you see the other uh, commission meetings up on top, and then we've got the uh, regular council meeting that we're planning for June 21st. And as of right now, uh, there's some tentative items on there, including adoption of a, perhaps an ARPA plan, which you discussed tonight. And I applaud you for your efforts, by the way. That was, uh, that was well played, I think. That was an outstanding effort. And then we got a couple other issues there, uh, tentative discussions with uh, tenant protections for ARCH, which I believe is the um, a regional coalition for housing, and the six-year transportation improvement plan our program will be presented by our, our staff as well. And then on the back page, there's a, a number of items that have, we've, uh, staff has carried over from um, week to week. And if there's any questions about that, the staff would be happy to address those. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Deputy Mayor Sherlock, go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Director Bronze. Um, so the, we have a discussion at the next meeting for the six-year transportation improvement program. And then it looks like the next meeting, we would potentially adopt that. That's correct. So what do you want? What's the goal of the discussion? So a, a past practice is that we staff presents their proposed six-year transportation improvement pro program, and then the council provides feedback, either suggests projects, uh, suggests a change in schedule, uh, removes projects, and then we bring back the uh, recommended final at the next meeting for adoption. Okay. And Thanks. we we basically take the current years. You know, it's a six-year rolling window, so. We will start off with what was what's currently adopted, roll that forward one year, and then look at what we have on our 20-year capital improvement plan, which is the um, in the comprehensive plan for okay. projects that are. You know, we, and those those are ranked by priority, high, medium, and low. And that was just recently up to, updated, I believe, in 2020. So, okay. so councils in terms of preparing for that, if they want to look at the current TIP and if they have any 
comments or edits on that, they can certainly send those to me in advance of the meeting, as well as look at the, trend, the capital um, appendix in the comprehensive plan and look at the rankings of projects there. Okay, and thank you. And I just wanted to alert council of this because it's taken me a couple of years to figure out the, the schedule of everything and this ties into budget, correct? Right, and actually, so that's a good good uh, point. Thank you, Councilmember Sherlock. Um, so the state uh, state law requires us to up, not only update our trans our TIP yearly, but they also stipulate that it has to be adopted by um, the end of June and then s sent to the Secretary of Transportation within thirty days. So we're not quite following that, and nobody's going to really care, to be honest. But and that's because uh, the town hall, it's not really worth having a special meeting to accommodate that deadline. Um, it'll it'll get turned in, um, so that's why we do that in June, and then a, a handful of years ago, uh, typ typically during the capital but during the operating budget, by the time we get around to capital, everybody's pretty kind of tired and, and worn out, and uh, so during the summer, we're already talking about transportation. So since the the adopted TIP generally feeds into the capital budget for that following year, that why not talk about parks and swim CIP at the same time. So what we've been doing for the past few years is uh, we start off with transportation, have a discussion, and then the next meeting we, we adopt the transportation, and at the same time we talk about parks and stormwater. And we don't, we don't have anything to adopt necessarily, but I've started to present it in the same format just for discussion purposes, and then again that would then roll into the budget cycle. And there, you can certainly make changes, but the, uh, the goal is to give the council uh, more time at a more relaxed pace to talk about capital before it gets into the budget cycle. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any uh, other question about, uh, could we briefly discuss what's gonna happen at the town hall? I, you said you were gonna meet about it, but I, before we get there, could we? We're working on the agenda still. It's um, primarily the ARPA and some Q&A. Uh, our moderator is Nathan Sticks who's our Community Activities Commission Vice Chair. Um, and uh, there'll be some, um, uh, not, we're not using the post pad, we're using a different mechanism for the questions, the little, you know, on the fly questions. It's like electronic. Would you like, sure. Um, so the pulse pads, we have them, they're in the, in the server room and they've just, the software that is required to use them and uh, it's, had a lot of challenges in the past and hasn't it hasn't worked smoothly. The um, now there's and may, maybe many of you have uh, experienced this. There's many multiple uh, apps uh, platforms and you can use it on your smartphone. And uh, we, I was looking at two of them. One of them you can just scan a QR code, but it does not have the ability to use a text function. So the other one uh, has a text function. So if somebody just has a flip phone, they can still participate. And so they would be they text a a number and then they could respond to their votes and then it, in real time it displays the results on screen. That's what we're planning to use and then uh, it provides that real time feedback similar to the pulse pads but it's got more flexibility and it's more robust. So we have an hour of uh, you know, for community socializing and then I assume that there's going to be questions for the audience who decides those questions and where, what are we, what, what we going to be asking or are the questions going to be random from the audience? How is that going to work? There well, we're going to intertwine them throughout the program. That's kind of the plan right now. But like I said, we haven't finalized the agenda. We haven't finalized questions yet. So uh, we're trying to get some information about, um, you know, their thoughts on priorities on the ARPA funding. Um, and we want to allow a good, I think we, we're, we're talking about 30 to 45 minutes of Q&A, live Q&A with the audience just to give them some opportunities to ask questions and even provide comments about the ARPA. I would appreciate having in, some input on if we're going to ask uh, questions for the audience, like what do you think A or B or whatever, that you know we should all have some kind of a say in what that is. I, that's my opinion. So maybe you could send those to us and we could say this is good or this is bad. I mean, it's kind of short notice, unfortunately. I didn't understand that we were going to do this. So but I would like to know that we all had a chance to weigh in on what the audience is going to be asked by us. If you have questions you want considered, please email them to me by the end of Thursday. All right. Okay. 
right. Um, I believe we are at the end of our agenda, so I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everyone.